So uh, let's welcome Uma Girish, and she will tell us about some quantum communication advantages with one clean qubit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks for coming. I'll be telling you about quantum communication advantages using just one clean qubit. This is based on a joint work with Srinivasan Arunachalam and Noam Lushitz. Let me start by giving you the motivation for this talk. The motivating question is the following. Do quantum algorithms exponentially outperform classical ones? Well, given that this is a TQC audience, most of us believe that the answer is yes. But proving this belief is a very hard problem and would imply major complexity theoretic breakthroughs. So one can ask, are there settings where we can unconditionally prove this? It turns out that query and communication complexity are two striking examples of such settings where you can prove that quantum algorithms exponentially outperform classical ones. In this talk, the focus will be on communication complexity. The second question motivating our work is the one clean qubit model. How powerful are quantum algorithms with just one clean qubit? I will formally define these algorithms later, but roughly speaking, one qubit is in a pure state and all others are maximally mixed. And the question is what kind of useful quantum computations can you do with such highly mixed states? Again, people believe that this model, despite being highly noisy, can exponentially outperform classical computation. But as before, we don't have a proof of this. So this leads us to ask, are there settings where we can unconditionally prove this? And this is the main uh, result of our work. We prove that in communication complexity, the one clean qubit model exponentially outperforms classical communication. So this gives the first provable exponential speed up between the one clean qubit model and the classical model. In the rest of the talk, I'm going to define these models more formally and tell you more about the details, but this is the main takeaway from this talk. So let me start by introducing communication complexity. The communication complexity setting is a very important setting in complexity theory. This studies the amount of communication required to compute functions with distributed inputs. You have a function whose inputs are distributed between two or more parties, and their goal is to determine the value of this function while using as little communication as possible. This setting has several applications to lower bounds in streaming algorithms, distributed algorithms, and even classical circuit complexity. This has also played a central role in the field of quantum computation and information. There are many examples of quantum protocols that demonstrate the advantages of quantum communication or non-locality or entanglement and so on. There's also a long and rich history of unconditional exponential speedups of quantum over classical. We have many examples of functions for which quantum communication can provide exponential savings over classical communication. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of these results, but first let me formally define the communication complexity model. So here you have a function that depends on two n-bit inputs, x and y. Alice gets x, Bob gets y, and they want to determine f of x, y. This function f might be a partial function, that is, it takes values in 0, 1, and star, where think of star as don't know or don't care, and the players are promised that they're given inputs x and y, such that f is either 0 or 1 on this input. And their goal is to determine whether it is 0 or 1. Now, since the, each player doesn't know the other player's input, they need to communicate in order to be able to evaluate this function. And their goal is to minimize the amount of communication. For example, Alice could simply reveal her entire input to Bob. In other words, she can send a description of x, which takes n bits of communication. And the goal is to do much better, to somehow be able to compute f by using only polylog n communication. We formalize this by the notion of a communication cost of a protocol, which is basically the maximum number of bits or qubits of communication that the players ever send. This is the broad setting of communication complexity. In a classical communication protocol, communication typically proceeds in rounds. And in each round, the player sends a message to the other player, which is a bit string. And finally, Bob announces the answer. 
we will always allow randomized communication that is the players always have access to shared randomness and their messages can depend on this randomized string and their goal is to compute the function with high probability at least two thirds this is the setting of classical communication complexity and now we can talk about quantum communication complexity there are typically two types of resources in quantum communication complexity the first is the ability to send quantum messages the second is the ability to share entanglement typically between alice and bob usually in the form of a few epr pairs these resources often behave incomparably and there are many open problems regarding the interplay of these two resources this is the broad setting of quantum and classical communication complexity i'll talk about a few restrictive models of communication based on the number of rounds so we can impose restrictions on the number of rounds of the protocol that is the number of times that alice and bob can take turns when communicating in the most restrictive setting you have simultaneous communication where alice and bob don't talk with each other instead they send a message to a third party charlie charlie doesn't see the inputs of alice and bob she only sees the messages and based on the messages she has to come up with the answer this is very similar to the setting of non local games a less restrictive model is the one way model where alice sends bob a single message and bob must return the answer the least restrictive model is the two way model where alice can and bob can send messages back and forth and finally bob announces the answer these are three successively stronger models of quantum communication and you can come up with functions that you can solve with k rounds but with k minus 1 rounds the communication cost blows up exponentially so now let me introduce the main problem in quantum versus classical communication which is what is the power of quantum communication versus classical communication are there partial functions which can be computed using quantum protocols of small cost but not any classical protocol of small cost and as i mentioned before to you the answer to this question is indeed there are many examples of functions that demonstrate such an exponential quantum speed up and there is a long line of works showing many such examples and loosely speaking these works are trying to actually answer the more fine grained version of the question which is the following what is the minimum quantum resource sufficient for an exponential quantum communication speed up in particular gavinsky who has thought a lot about these problems asks what is the weakest quantum communication model that outperforms its classical counterpart what is the strongest classical model over which the quantum counterpart shows an exponential advantage there's been a long line of works that are broadly motivated by trying to understand this question and these are some of the uh, most important results along these lines the strongest of these results is the last one yeah so the strongest of these results is due to gavinsky and myself ran and avishay we show that quantum simultaneous communication where alice and bob share entanglement can exponentially outperform randomized classical two way communication so this is saying that a rather weak model of quantum communication can exponentially outperform a rather strong model of classical communication and this result qualitatively subsumes these previous results this is pretty much the state of the art result although recently there have been many works that try to remove the entanglement in this protocol although they are only for relational problems and not for partial functions so there is still a lot to be understood here and improving this result is a big open problem in our work we morally try to improve this result by studying advantages of even weaker quantum protocols than these kind of uh, even weaker protocols than these kind of protocols namely we study advantages using one clean qubit protocols and entangled fingerprinting protocols i will formally define these protocols in the next few slides So first, let's start with the one clean qubit protocol. This is motivated by the one clean qubit model of quantum computing. This was defined by Kinnell and Laflamme, who are trying to understand the NMR approach to quantum computing, where mixed states are highly prevalent. So in this one clean qubit model, also called DQC one, there is one qubit that is in a pure state, and all others are maximally mixed. you are allowed to apply quantum operations on these states and the question is how powerful is this model 
Interestingly, this model, despite being highly noisy, can solve some problems that are believed to be exponentially harder for classical algorithms. In particular, we know that under complexity theoretic assumptions, this model is not efficiently classically similar. These results suggest that the one clean qubit model is indeed much more powerful than the classical model. And we ask, are there unconditional speedups? Are there settings where you can prove exponential separations between the one clean qubit model and the classical model? A natural setting to study unconditional speedups is communication complexity. So this brings us to one clean qubit communication. This was formally defined by Hartmut Clock and Debbie Lim. In this model, initially you have a state where the first, where the first qubit is in the pure state zero and all other qubits are maximally mixed. That is there in the state identity over two to the n. And now Alice and Bob take turns applying unitary matrices on these qubits. We're going to assume that Alice and Bob don't have any other private quantum memory. All their memory is constrained to these qubits. And the only thing they can do is apply unitary operators and send them back and forth. The cost of the protocol is defined to be the number of rounds times the number of qubits per round. So in this example, it is four rounds of quantum communication consisting of m plus one qubits each. So it's four times m plus one. This is the one clean qubit model of communication complexity. And Hartmut, Clock, and Debbie Lim ask, what is the power of one clean qubit communication? All the interesting examples of quantum protocols that we saw earlier in communication complexity seem to require at least log n qubits. And one can ask, what is the power of quantum communication when you have just one clean qubit? Can it, for example, be classically simulated? This is the main problem that we resolve in our work. We show that the one clean qubit model of communication is not efficiently classically similar. In particular, we give an example of a partial function where Alice and Bob get n square bit inputs, such that this problem has a quantum communication protocol of small cost with just one clean qubit. But every classical randomized protocol is of exponentially larger cost. This, uh, this resolves the conjecture of a clock and limb, and it gives the first unconditional separation between DQC1 and DPB in the communication. So this is our main result. I'd like to emphasize that the classical lower bound here holds for all classical communication protocols of small cost. So Alice and Bob can interact, and they have any number of clean qubits. So the lower bound is for a very strong model of classical communication, whereas the upper bound is for a very weak model of quantum communication, namely the one clean qubit model. So this is our main result. Let me also tell you the problem for which our main result applies. And our problem is called the ABCD problem. Here, Alice, Bob, Alice and Bob get unitary matrices. So Alice gets A comma C and Bob gets B comma D, where all of these are n by n special unitary matrices. And their goal is to roughly tell whether the product ABCD is close to identity or far from identity. More precisely, they want to tell if the trace of A times B times C times D is large or small, where large is at least 0.9n or at most 0.1n. This problem is motivated by the trace estimation of unitaries, which is in some sense complete for DQC1, and this is a communication version of this problem. And we show that this problem has a one clean qubit protocol of small cost, but no small cost randomized classical protocol. So this is our first main result. Next, I'd like to talk about entangled fingerprinting protocols. Let me start by telling you about fingerprinting communication first. This was a model of communication defined by Boorman, Cleave, uh, Waters, and Dewey. This model consists of quantum simultaneous protocols where Charlie simply performs a swap test. So Alice and Bob get inputs x and y. They send quantum states to the referee rho x and sigma y. And the referee Charlie simply does a swap test between the two quantum states. This is a very restrictive type of quantum simultaneous protocol and is called a fingerprinting protocol. This model has some advantages over classical uh, fingerprinting protocols. 
But once Alice and, ha and Bob have public randomness, this model becomes classically simulable. So in the presence of public randomness, this model has no quantum advantages over classical. You can mimic quantum fingerprints using classical fingerprints in the presence of randomness. What we study is entangled fingerprinting communication, which is essentially the same model, but Alice and Bob are allowed to start off with some entanglement. We will assume that the entanglement consists of a few EPR pairs. Alice can apply some quantum operations on her part of the EPR pairs. Bob can apply some quantum operation, and they can send all their qubits to the referee. And as before, Charlie just does a swap test. This is the entangled fingerprinting protocol. And what we show is, interestingly, this, pro this kind of protocols can show exponential quantum speedups. In particular, if you look at the ABCD problem that I mentioned before, this problem has an entangled fingerprinting protocol of small cost, provided Alice and Bob share a few EPR pairs. So this is saying that with just the resource of entanglement, fingerprinting protocols can exponentially outperform classical interactive protocols. So this is our second result. In the next five minutes or so, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the proof ideas. And this might be a little technical, but for those of you who are familiar with these analytical tools, I hope it will give you some idea. Um, ah, right, sorry. So first, I'd like to um, let me mention the this result in the context of previous work. So our result qualitatively improves the state of the art separation because we show a quantum versus classical separation for a weaker quantum model, namely quantum simultaneous with entanglement, where Charlie simply does a swap test. So in this result, our second main theorem subsumes the previous separations between quantum and classical communication complexity. So this is the significance of our second result. And now let me tell you about the proof ideas. The main technical tool is a level k inequality for SUN. So I'll describe this inequality in the next slide. This inequality was developed by Ellis, Kindler, uh, Lifshitz, and Minzer. They were trying to understand the size of product-free sets in SUN. So they wanted to understand what is the largest subset of SUN that does not contain three matrices ABC such that AB equals C. In trying to answer this question, they developed this level k inequality, which is a powerful analytic tool. And they used it to show that any large subset of SUN cannot be product free. So any subset of SUN of measure at least e to the minus n to the one third must contain three matrices such that AB equals C. This is the context in which they develop level k inequalities over SUN. In general, level k inequalities have been established over various domains most notably the Boolean hypercube, the unit sphere, the Gaussian distribution, and so on. And these inequalities have several applications, most notably to the field of quantum versus classical separations in communication complexity. In particular, two of the results I mentioned before use the level k inequality on minus 1, 1 to the n. One of these uses level k inequalities in the unit sphere, and our result uses level k inequalities on SUN. So here is the level k inequality on SUN. Loosely speaking, it says that a large set cannot have a large degree k component. To formalize the notion of degree k component over SUN, you can do it as follows. So let's look at all functions on unitary matrices. So functions that take in unitary matrices and output real numbers. Some of these functions can be expressed as low degree polynomials in the entries of these matrices, u and u dagger. We call these functions low degree polynomials. So L at most k consists of polynomials of degree at most k. If you subtract polynomials of degree k minus 1, you're left with polynomials of pure degree k. And this is what I mean by level k. And here is the level k inequality. It says that if you have a subset of SUN whose measure under the Haar distribution is alpha, if you take the indicator function of A, then the level k component of this indicator function has a small L2 norm. So here, indicator of a equals k is the projection of the indicator function onto the pure degree k part. And this inequality says that the L2 norm square of this is small. 
I'm not going to have time to give some intuition on this inequality, but for those of you who have seen the level K inequality over the Boolean hypercube, let me just contrast these two inequalities. So over the Boolean hypercube, you have the following inequality. Given any subset of minus one, one to the N of measure alpha, the level K component has L2 square at most this. So it's very similar to the level K inequality over minus one, one to the N, but this one works over SUN. And this is a very powerful inequality, and this is the main inequality we use to derive our lower bound. So in the next few slides, let me give you a very quick idea of how we use this inequality. So first, the main place where we use this inequality is in the lower bound. So to show that the ABCD problem has no classical randomized protocol of small cost, we first reduce the problem to a problem about rectangles. This is a very standard argument in communication complexity. If you look at the matrix where the rows are indexed by Alice's input and the columns by Bob's inputs, a communication protocol partitions this matrix into a few components. A protocol of cost C partitions this space into two to the C rectangles, and within each rectangle, the output of the protocol is constant. This is a very standard argument in communication complexity. And to prove the lower bound, we show that any rectangle that is not too small cannot distinguish a random yes instance of the problem from a random no instance of the problem. So this is our main technical lemma. More commonly, we have the following result. Let P and Q be the indicator functions of Alice's and Bob's sides of the rectangle. These are just subsets of SUN times SUN. And we assume that these rectangles are not too small. So these P and Q have measured at least alpha and beta under the Haar random distribution. Then these two quantities are close. So what are these two quantities? On the left-hand side, you have the probability that a random yes instance is in this rectangle. And on the right-hand side, you have the probability that a random no instance is in this rectangle. And we argue that these two quantities are very close. This is our main technical lemma. And the way we prove this is by doing Fourier analysis and trying to decompose these indicator functions and then applying the level K inequality over SUN. So this is the big picture of our proof. Let me conclude by a, mentioning an open problem, which is the following. Is there an oracle separation between BQC1 and BPP? In other words, in query complexity, can you prove an exponential separation between the one clean qubit model and the classical query model? Typically, separations in communication complexity are harder to establish than in query complexity, but in this case, we believe this is an independently interesting problem that is of incomparable difficulty. So this brings me to the end of my talk. I'm happy to take questions. Now. OK, we again have a time for one or two quick questions. Do you know if the communication complexity setting, there will be difference if you have the QC1 and the QC2 or K, let's say? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think you can simulate a certain number of qubits using just one clean qubit. Although I think the scaling is different in communication complexity, it is more like log log n as opposed to log n. But I, I'm not sure, but I think this is So for the oracle separation uh, on this last slide here, um, is it a classical or quantum oracle separation? Yeah. So ideally, we want it to be a classical oracle because how do you how would how would the classical algorithm access a quantum oracle? So. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. I see. Okay. Then uh, let's thank Uma for this great talk again. Thank mm -hmm. you.